Jody, thank you for that excellent presentation and providing really some level setting, I think, for, for the audience. So at this time, I'd like to invite our moderator and panelists to the stage. Understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have shoelaces. <laughs> so our moderator for this morning is Gail Walensky. I think many of you know Gail. She's a senior fellow at Project Hope and a former administrator of the Healthcare Financing Administration. Gail is also serving as one of four co-chairs, along with former Senate Majority Leaders Tom Daschle and Bill Frist, and also Andy Slavitt, on a new bipartisan group of health policy experts here at BPC to identify a path forward on health care reform. Uh, Gail, thanks again for your leadership, and I'll let you take it away from here. Great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, this is a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart. It is something I started wor working on about a dozen years ago or more. Uh, not as there are other people, of course, who've worked on it uh, longer, but it uh, is one that uh, increases in importance as the technology pipeline uh, keeps uh, putting out uh, new and frequently new and expensive uh, technologies. We have a very interesting mix of people today. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce them uh, and then uh, ask people to make just a uh, couple minutes of comments, uh, if you can try to keep it to about three, four at the most, uh, and then uh, want to uh, ask you some questions. Uh, although you may want to make some comments based on what uh, Jody Siegel uh, mentioned in, in her uh, comments. Um, our uh, first panelist is going to be Jen Hyde. Uh, she is uh, here uh, in a perspective that uh, too often doesn't get enough uh, attention, although it does from uh, PCORI, uh, and that is the patient's uh, perspective. Uh, she's a heart valve ambassador for the American Heart Association. Uh, her uh, more interesting activity is, uh, she tells me she's a poet. Uh, her uh, sometime daytime job uh, is a writing teacher at uh, NYU, but I like the poet notion uh, better. That sounds uh, more interesting. Um, we're then going to uh, hear from uh, Joe Selby. Uh, he is a physician who has been the executive director uh, of PCORI since it was uh, established. Uh, following uh, Joe, we'll hear from uh, Carolyn Clancy, also uh, a physician uh, who's been at the VA uh, for, this is now the fourth year. Uh, she is Deputy Undersecretary for Health for Organizational Excellence. Uh, somebody needs to come up with shorter titles at the VA, but um, at, it is descriptive, uh, and had been <laughs> the Executive Director at ARC uh, for the previous uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, but uh, definitely not of least importance, my fellow economist, uh, Murray Ross, uh, who is uh, uh, vice president for the Kaiser Foundation and leads the Permanentes Institute uh, for uh, Health Policy. But more importantly to me was uh, the first uh, executive director of uh, MedPAC when I was uh, chairing it. So, Jen? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really grateful to have your ear today. Um, I was born with Tetralogy of Fallot, it's a congenital heart defect, and I was diagnosed at birth. Um, I didn't have very much of a pulmonary valve, and I had a hole at the bottom of my heart. Um, my parents were advised that I have an open heart surgery. Uh, sometime earlier on, they were told by doctors that I would forget the experience, though I have these dreams of waking up from that surgery still. Um, in 1988, I had my first open heart and I received a shunt where the valve um, would be or could be. At the time, the research was approximately as old as me, as I think it always might be. Um, but I, my, my parents were told, you know, she probably, I probably would not be very active, um, very athletic, but that I would lead a fairly active, normal lifestyle. 
Um, so I, I grew up with that experience and, and grew up with that knowledge that I had been fixed in some way. That was a word that was given to me for my narrative. Um, and I moved through the world as a fixed person who was not athletic, but I think it was more because I was clumsy than, um, than <laughs> not being able to, to play sports. Um, but in 2009, I had moved to mainland China to teach English abroad and was hiking in the Himalayas and applied to graduate school. Was accepted to NYU to uh, study poetry. And, um, and when I came back to the States, my mom advised that I get back on my parents' health insurance and that I go see a cardiologist. It had been a number of years since I had seen one. I had fallen out of care um, at the age of 18 or 19, um, thinking I was an adult living in New York City and as a fixed person didn't necessarily need to see a cardiologist anymore. I'm really grateful for my mom um, to pushing me to go see a cardiologist because at that time, in 2009, I was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. And I was told that I would need a surgery relatively soon to repair uh, the shunt and repair the valve because I didn't have much of a valve and my heart had enlarged so much that I was about six months shy of heart failure. I was in California when I received the news that I had pulmonary hypertension and I was advised to go see a surgeon and a cardiologist in New York when I got back to school. So in 2010, early 2010, the director of my writing program, a wonderful woman, um, gave me the name of a cardiologist at NYU. I went to go see him. He's an adult cardiologist. At the time there was no adult CHD cardiologist so I shuffled back and forth between his care, a um, pediatric cardiologist, and a pediatric um, surgeon and I was given three options for repair a mechanical valve and it would be a one-time operation a porcine valve and a bovine heart valve a bioprosthetic heart valve which is the one that my doctor had recommended to me it was a valve it is a valve that will not last forever unlike the mechanical valve but it was advisable because of my lifestyle I'm still a fairly active person even if clumsy um, and that the valve would last a long time and that at some point I would need a follow-up procedure and that they would have that follow-up procedure in place when I would need it. Um, since 2010 I've been a heart valve ambassador for the American Heart Association sharing my experience with patients who might be encountering this experience for themselves for the first time and helping them in any way I can um, by providing emotional support or helping them gain access to resources that the AHA provides. Thank you. Uh, Joe, um, can you talk a little bit, uh, given uh, the perspective uh, that you uh, have as a result of being at PCORI, uh, about how to make sure that comparative effectiveness remains uh, patient-centered, uh, and then what can be done to actually make it uh, as patient-relevant as possible? Sure. Well, um, as, as you remember, um, 2008, 2009 was a time when, although a lot of people were enthused about comparative effectiveness research and, and ARC had already uh, really uh, made some real uh, major steps in the methods of CER, there was also a lot of concern about uh, the fact that CER was really nothing more than an attempt to keep uh, newer, better, um, in parentheses, um, more costly, also in parentheses, uh, services um, from widespread use. So there was a lot of worry about that. So we were named the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute in the Affordable Care Act rather than the CER Institute. And uh, I like to say, you know, what's in the name? It, it made all the difference uh, and it focused our board and our staff on the notion uh, that, that really healthcare is about serving patients and f by and large, for the last 50 or 60 years, we've made decisions about what to research, what to consider as the outcomes, and, and what to recommend, not so much on the basis of patients um, as on the basis of, um, among other things, um, scientific interest, uh, convenience. Uh, one person at the institution where I used to work called us the physician-centric delivery system. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, but I, I just want to say that I think Jen's presence here today illustrates that uh, patients face major decisions, many patients, people face major decisions. They come to those decisions with a distinct set of um, 
uh, life experiences, goals, uh, aspirations. Uh, and they also uh, are well equipped to be articulate, if not always poetic, um, um, discussants in the uh, decisions about what's important to research. So to your question, Gail, um, we've hit on the notion that patient-centered outcomes research or patient-centered CER means comparative effectiveness research that, that, that studies comparisons that matter to patients, choices that matter to patients. I hasten to add, this doesn't mean that you are sitting in a room and the patient raised the question. Patients aren't always the only ones that have questions. A clinician may have raised the question. A payer may have raised the question. A policymaker may have raised the question, but, but in the end we say, does this question matter to patients once they've been informed as to why the physician, payer, or policymaker wants to know? So does the question matter? And the second important part is, it, this is outcomes research, so are the outcomes that we're studying the outcomes that patients need, need information on? And here we really are asking about patients. So yes, we'll study mortality. You know, this valve procedure has a 2% mortality rate, where this other one has a 4% mortality rate. That's an important piece of information. But also, will I be able to be a clumsy athlete, or will I be able to uh, walk up a flight of stairs? Um, uh, Will I be able to continue the activities that I was doing? Uh, and also I will say, what will it cost me? What will the out-of-pocket cost be for me of these two? Those are all things that real patients consider. So uh, is the comparison right, matter to patients, and do the um, outcomes meet the needs of patients? So I think that's how we make it patient-centered, and we do that by involving patients and the other stakeholders I mentioned in everything we do. I'll be quiet after I just say one last thing, Gail, and that is that um, Jody mentioned that comparative effectiveness research is really the way we get uh, the answers to clinical questions that patients and physicians have. So. Uh, the types of research that get new products on the market leave us short of information about who it works for and how it works compared to what we did yesterday. Um, that's very important. Y um, she also pointed out that systems questions, systems solutions are often the solutions to questions that, that matter the most to patients. So the, the IOM found that 50, named 50 of their questions had to do with systems. So people forget that sometimes, and we've been told systems questions are not the questions that PCORI was set up to answer. Gail mentioned new technology, and I hope we talk about new technology, because I think a number of people had new technologies as the primary focus of uh, CER, and there's a lot to be said about that. And then there's those old, nagging, practical questions about how much to take, how long to take it? Would it be okay to stop taking this expensive medicine with side effects after two years if I'm doing well? Those really practical. CER covers all of that stuff, and uh, I think we've learned it over the last six, seven years. Uh, Carolyn, both uh, given your time at ARC uh, as a major sponsor of, um, uh, of comparative effectiveness research, and also now uh, the work that you've been leading at uh, the VA, um, do you think there uh, is, remains, uh, a strong commitment, a medium commitment toward uh, comparative effectiveness research uh, in these agencies and other agencies of the federal government? Or uh, as sometimes happens, uh, there's waxing and waning uh, as new issues come up? So I think the interest remains strong, even if that's not always the headline. And I'll explain a little bit about uh, what I mean there. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here on behalf of VA. The notion of knowing which treatments work for which patients and under what circumstances, and very importantly, does the effect last? If I took a drug for six months a year for depression and I stopped and a year or two later I am having some of the same symptoms, should I be back on the same treatment and so forth? Really our literature is pretty silent on a lot of those questions, although they're pretty real to uh, lots of patients. Um, I think many of you may be surprised to know just how strong and uh, comprehensive a portfolio the VA has in research, so I wanted to mention uh, just a couple of examples. One of the aspects of it that makes it very uh, unique is that more than 60% of our investigators provide direct care in our system. 
So trying to figure out which treatments work for which patients has been, I mean, it's an organic part of what we do, and then getting that information out to clinicians and patients all across our system. Uh, a very, very large system with electronic health records, uh, barcoding, by the way, for medicines, uh, which was the brainchild of a nurse in our system undergoing uh, chemotherapy herself and wondering, am I getting the right uh, medicines here? Is the, does that have my name on it, literally and figuratively? Um, so a lot of great success stories. And we also have a very large cooperative studies program, which is clinical trials by any other name. In fact, uh, in the past year or two, we've launched two point-of-service studies. If you ever looked at a clinical trial, you know that a very elaborate infrastructure is developed and built. And then when the study's over, the infrastructure goes away, the people move on to other positions. And the question has always been if we're collecting all this data in patient care as a result of providing care, could we use that for studies? And we've got a couple of those going on now, which drastically reduces the investment needed to answer uh, very important questions. And the last example I'll just mention, um, we had to actually make research investments in figuring out what were the best treatments for veterans experiencing serious mental and behavioral health issues. So we learned in a study of women veterans, for example, that prolonged exposure therapy was more effective for veterans with uh, PTSD. This was not a question that someone came to us sp specifically, but it was an experience and diagnosis we were seeing more broadly among the veterans uh, returning from recent conflicts. Uh, we work very, very closely with uh, NIH, uh, with our academic affiliates. We're affiliated with about 130 of the nation's uh, medical schools, um, have some big studies going on with NIH right now, and frankly, with ARC. And what but in addition to conducting and supporting research, we actually offer a terrific resource for disseminating that, right? Because if we make great studies and they're not actually used to the benefit of patients, then we will have uh, missed a huge, huge opportunity. I think what we will see in the future across all these agencies, and VA has a big role here, is incorporating new information. So we have something called the Million Veteran Program. Over half a million veterans have enrolled. We're the only source right this m moment where we have both the genomic data as well as their electronic uh, clinical record data. So over time, we will be not only looking at which treatments work for, say, lung cancer, but we'll be able to link that back to genomic profiles. And this has been a very, very strong partnership uh, with the veterans themselves. So I'm excited about the future. Um, and the question is whether we keep it out there as a headline or whether we continue to do good work. I think it's such an exciting time to be alive that there's so many options when you have a problem uh, that all of us deserve and want good information about what's the right treatment for me. Murray, as somebody uh, who is now at Kaiser as an integrated delivery system uh, and who has spent a lot of time thinking about Medicare as a major uh, payer, um, but also uh, the provider implications how is the rise in interest in comparative effectiveness uh, impact decision making, either as you see it at Kaiser or as you might envision it uh, in terms of some portions of Medicare? Sure. Well, we are an integrated delivery system. Um, we take care of um, just north of 11 million people now. And uh, you know we're responsible um, to them as patients one at a time, and we're responsible to them as uh, 11 million people. And we have a you know somewhat unique setting in, the, in that we're a capitated system. Um, we have a budget to work with, and it's a real natural for us to um, think about uh, how do you improve things from a systems perspective, not just do, do things one at a time. No one's income in our organization depends on volume, and we use comparative effectiveness research and other sources to make clinical decisions, not coverage decisions. So, and I guess the last point I'd make is you know we have. Um, evidence uh, and, and data in our DNA. We've been doing this long before there were computers. Um, and Joe could certainly speak to some of the pictures on the walls of our, um, his former building. Uh, it's just a natural when you're, you know, when you have the evidence for a large population to be looking at things and saying, why are some doing better than others? Whether it's in, whether it's some clinicians doing better than others, whether it's some treatments doing better than others, whether it's some 
settings doing better than others. And uh, you, you know, we sort of live and breathe this stuff. I mean, an example I would give, and we wrote about it recently, was our um, decision 10 years ago to improve our performance on colorectal cancer screening. Uh, when colonoscopy was the gold standard, we were not hitting the targets that we had set for ourselves. And you know, what are the options there? Well, you can remind people ever more frequently in a louder voice, but there's a reason that they don't um, particularly like that, um, that test. Uh, with the, uh, um, the new, then new availability of uh, fecal occult blood testing, and then later the, what is it, the fecal immunochemical test, um, we were able to shift how we did things um, to, to make it much more you know, patient oriented, to be able to send a kit to people, to send an email from their, uh, their physician, to do follow up reminders. I can speak from personal uh, experience that if you're a person over 50 and you're not uh, numerator compliant, you're, you're offered a kit at every opportunity when you go in for your flu shot and eventually you, you take care of it. But the outcome was very sort of triple aim. You had better clinical results lower costs and happier patients. And that was to me sort of both the power of thinking differently and outside of the box and, and applying a, and then monitoring to see what kind of results you're getting, uh, sort of doing comparative effectiveness research um, in, in the real world, so to speak. How can we uh, make the information that comes out about comparative effectiveness research or that may be available for comparative effectiveness research more easily known and available both to the clinicians and the patients. Uh, Joe and I have had this conversation. Uh, I am uh, strongly interested uh, in understanding what's been happening in this area, uh, and yet uh, I frequently have to struggle uh, to find out, uh, although I'm getting much more adept at Google searches than I used to be, uh, but it's not either readily known or readily available. What can we do to change that? And maybe, Joe, if you could just take a, a couple minutes. And, and then Murray is a provider, a provider uh, payer, and, and Carolyn uh, is from the VA perspective. Yeah. Well, I just, uh, before I came over here, I just greeted our board committee on dissemination and implementation because uh, that is a um, huge concern and has been of, of PCORI's Board of Governors. Uh, how do you get the information out? We know the story about it sitting on the shelf for 17 years. One of the reasons it used to sit on the shelf for 17 years was because it was the wrong information, so <laughs> it wasn't useful. But uh, assuming that we're now providing useful information, how are we going to get it out there? There's not doesn't seem to be one simple way. I think uh, some of the purveyors of information on uh, the internet are very good, and so one, uh, one uh, obvious uh, strategy would be to ally yourselves with them. Uh, the other, though, is, uh, or among the others, are making the research articles available. Mm -hmm. Many journals uh, don't make the article available without paying 30 or $35, so we've done everything we could to, uh, including financing, um, the uh, making journal articles when they appear publicly available uh, for free at the time they appear. So that's one little thing. We also have a very strict policy about posting the uh, results within uh, uh, 30 days in an abstract form on our website and uh, appear reviewing the, uh, the final report from each research project and then posting that final report from the project on our website so it can be searched by PubMed and, and organizations like that. Part of the dissemination is building good shared decision-making approaches so that physicians and patients have tools to talk about it. Uh, and uh, you know there are other social media, other larger strategies. It's definitely multi-pronged. It depends on who the audience is and what the type of information is. But you're so right that um, we and everyone have to do better at getting useful information out. Um, Murray, from the either Kaiser and or Medicare, how do we have the kind of impact that those of us who are passionate supporters of comparative effectiveness research think is the potential but don't see readily around us? Well, on the patient side, uh, the dissemination of information, I, I think, is a real tough question because you know, none of us as patients, we don't know what we don't know. And I, I think um, all of us have experience sort of walking in. I, my adult son, 20, uh, then about eight years old, was a candidate for surgery to fix an issue in his foot. And we interviewed three surgeons about this, uh, one of whom, amazingly enough, recommended continued physical therapy. Um, one said, why don't you wait five years till he's in adolescence and maybe he sort of grows into it. And one was sort of ready to schedule surgery. 
and as a patient, you're sitting there, I don't know which of those three options is, and we were probably, the fact that we interviewed three surgeons was probably, you know, on the, on the, the, the leading edge. So I, I don't know what, the, you know, I don't know how to address that, but those are big challenges. On, on the provider side, um, our success is because of the links between the questions being raised by our physicians feeding into the research process, either in-house or, or, or with, um, you know, going out to the journals and, and to others, and then feeding that back to them um, in form of clinical decision support, but it's entirely contained within uh, the medical groups themselves. So they're, they're getting their information from their peers, people they trust, they know it's been vetted, they, you know, they, they know it's scientific. Uh, that trust piece is harder to do when things are just sort of you're being fed something because you found it through a Google search or a PubMed or whatever. It's okay, you found one study. Uh, does that represent all of the literature? Is there something new? Is there something coming out soon? The, the volume of information um, is, to me, one of the biggest challenges out there. Carolyn? Yeah, I'm a tad more optimistic, I think, on the patient side. Um, Part of the issue is, of course, we put information out about from research very broadly. Uh, if we're lucky, the media picks it up and so forth. Uh, in general, you're not going to have these questions uh, as a patient until you have a decision, right? Uh, which is not a huge majority of the population at any given point in time. I'm very excited about some of the work that ARC had launched on decision aids. Uh, because it, they required a lot of in-depth work to make uh, all of the concepts that Dr. Siegel presented so clearly to us extremely relevant to people who don't think about these issues um, at all. I do think uh, we will be seeing more and more, and this is a big theme at VA, about patients as partners in the enterprise, in which case patients will be asking more questions. Uh, and that drives some of this enterprise. And frankly, I think that we'll see more apps, mm -hmm. which I think is exciting. And long ago, we did a study about how do you get doctors' attention and uh, from good evidence and so forth. And if you think about the context of a very busy clinician, right, this, the response and the final conclusion makes a lot of sense. I want to know right now what's the answer or what are the two options. And then I, this is long before you could hyperlink, okay? And then I want to know where's the evidence. Can I check mm -hmm. that this isn't just a statement as in I think X approach is the best. And I think we'll see more and more of that coming out of patient groups, particularly because of Procori's investments. And last, I'd say social media is likely to have an impact, in which case we, the research enterprise, ought to be thinking about cultivating journalists, because what they read is going to drive what gets picked up in social media feeds. Jen, when you were being uh, forced, not so much as a young child, but sure. now as an adult, to uh, make some decisions, do you feel like you could access the kind of information that would make you an informed decision maker? Uh, you know, my attitude oh, whenever I've had to make a decision is nobody could possibly be more interested in my body than me. Uh, you've had more uh, concerns uh, because of your congenital uh, defect than many of us. Did you find the information available? How hard did you have to work? What did you wish had been available? Sure. Well, I think, you know, when you are someone who is encountering both a new diagnosis and then the necessity to respond to it, with some immediacy. Um, for me, it was like being an amateur and learning a foreign language all over again and thinking about where to look and how to look. Um, and it's taken me the seven years since my surgery to know how to look, to know how to read a journal article, for example, to know that some are published without paywalls and to advocate for the necessity for those articles to be available. Um, for me, it was very helpful to have a physician who really thought about our one-to-one -one relationship, that he was treating me and giving me advice, them, thinking about what would be best for my life, practically speaking, keeping in mind the technology that was available, but also ultimately helping me make that decision based on how I saw my life and what I wanted my life to be like. Um, he advised that I um, pursue the bovine heart valve procedure because he anticipated that I might be more active. At the time, I was, oh gosh, 
25 or 26 years old, and so I did want to mm -hmm. go and experience much more of the world. Not that you couldn't do that with these other options, but he seemed to think that my quality of life would not change. So having that professional ear is so important as well. Um, let me uh, raise it something. Oh, sorry. I just wanted, to, for the sake of completeness, to mention a couple other things that are part of the dissemination um, enterprise. So uh, one of them is that clinicians need this information, and clinicians are probably connected more than anything to their specialty groups. Mm -hmm. And so through guidelines uh, and standards that are promulgated by, uh, or at least have the endorsement of specialty groups, physicians learn a lot more about um, new research. Okay. So one of our goals and one of ARC's goals is to get that those research findings through evidence syntheses and into guidelines. So that really is probably one of the more important dissemination strategies. The other thing that I just want to say to share a bit of Carolyn's optimism, I think that as we begin addressing more questions that have real obvious relevance to patients and as we conduct more research in real world settings, the culture can, kind of, can begin to change to one where people, uh, before making a decision, they ask about the evidence and they ask about um, why we're not doing research on this. So I think uh, you can envision a future where research is much more a part of routine care. The point of care trials in the VA are exactly what we need. PCORnet, which we have financed, is another way to get research into community settings and uh, make both clinicians and patients more familiar with the fact that we often don't have the answer yet, and research is the way we find it. Can I ask Jen a quick question? Sure. So Jen, um, you know, these days people get all kinds of stuff coming to them as feeds, right? You can put the things in a Google feed or figure out what, what's happening with the market or headlines or whatever, sometimes too much. Um, but can you imagine that you were getting fed information, or even now, about what's happening uh, with the particular issues you had? What would you want to know? to verify or to kind of assure yourself that this is good information? Sure, I'd want the evidence to be credible. I'd yeah. want it to come from a credible institute, of course, and I would want to know how to question that. I'd want guidelines that were clear for me. Um, th these are the things that you should keep in mind as you're looking at these different articles that are coming through on a feed. Um, I think I'd also want to know um, both a professional, of course, a researcher's opinion, but then also as I'm thinking about my peer relationships through the AHA support network, how other people are also perceiving the information. I think that that feedback could also be helpful. Thanks. Sure. Um, when comparative effectiveness research is used in other uh, countries, frequently with uh, costs uh, um, embedded in it, uh, it's primarily directed toward decision making about whether to cover a new pharmaceutical. That's the most frequent use. Um, as uh, some of you know, uh, I've been very frustrated at this limited focus on comparative effectiveness research uh, because the bulk of the healthcare spending, uh, uh, annoying as some high pharmaceutical pricing can be, is not on pharmaceuticals. Uh, it is so much more with regard to uh, other types of intervention, surgery, medical interventions. Do you think? We've made progress in getting people to understand that this is not just about drug A versus drug B, uh, new drug A, old drug B, uh, two new drugs, two old drugs and their effectiveness, but really looking at the broader uh, issues of looking at clinical outcomes of surgical interventions versus medical interventions uh, versus uh, a therapeutic intervention involving uh, a new drug that people understand that is fundamentally the question that needs to be addressed. And since uh, FDA primarily is on safety and efficacy, efficacy of drugs in devices, but rarely surgical procedures, uh, only the instruments perhaps, there isn't a natural way to have this occur. We gotten beyond that, people understand this is really the most serious issue, or is it easily to get distracted on the old, much easier A or B drug? I don't know, with, with all, so each of you. I think in any area, uh, cancer comes to mind, uh, where 
immediately, first of all, they've got better developed patient networks, I think, than many conditions. Um, and when you start, you speak with a doctor and who may say, well, you should have X, Y, and Z. Uh, and often oncologists are quite good at telling you there are other options. And some of that's about timing, too. Do I have chemo before surgery or later and so forth? Um, the relevance is quite apparent, but a lot of it, I think, is generational. I think millennials and uh, I guess Generation Xers are much more likely to ask questions. Uh, today's Medicare beneficiaries, I would say, not so much. And I don't know that the practice environment writ large actually routinely welcomes that or makes room for it. So it's a little bit of your homework, and we might be able to use the paper. Joe, and I'd, then yeah. I would say that, um, well, our legislation told us to, number one, focus on high burden uh, conditions, so that, and it included uh, burden to society in terms of costs. And if you look at our research portfolio, it really is uh, concentrated predominantly on conditions that are prevalent and costly. Um, I think it's a testament to the fact that it's not just the A versus B. President Obama didn't get it quite right when he talked about the red pill and the green pill. Um, uh, there are some of that in our portfolio, but really the vast majority are about the role of procedures versus uh, uh, medical approaches, about system level interventions to improve the coordination of care or transitions in care. Um, I think um, that is very consistent with the type of research that we need to do to save to avoid waste and save money in our healthcare system. Um, systems like the VA, like Kaiser Permanente, naturally gravitate, I'd say, to those questions. It's totally obvious to them where the resources are going. So um, uh, comparative effectiveness research applies to much more than A versus B. A versus B, especially when it's new drugs, presents some special challenges. I'll come back to that. Okay, in a good. Murray? Yeah, well, I was just going to say that the, uh, you know, if you're speaking to a lay audience, the, the red pill, blue pill thing kind of, you know, make, makes sense. But if you look at the, the options that are out there, I don't know what is it say for prostate cancer now. I think there's seven options ranging from proton beam to watchful waiting um, with mixed evidence for at least six of them. Uh, but to Joe's point, you know, an integrated system has a bird's eye view and you, you can, you know, you can look at people rather than just at organ systems or particular conditions and, and be able to consider alternatives. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're a surgeon, you do surgery and it's sort of not your job to be thinking about all the other possibilities, but as a system, it, it is your job to be thinking about it. To your other point, Gail, on sort of the, you know, thinking about the cost side, I mean, we're very reluctant in this country to talk about opportunity costs, but not talking about them doesn't make them go away, right? It's, it's still there, so. Do you see the private payers, Medicare clearly uh, at the moment has no uh, legislative authority to introduce any sense of uh, costs uh, in terms of reimbursement uh, and, uh, uh, has been explicitly directed uh, against the uh, PCORI uh, outcomes uh, finding in terms of some of its uh, decision making. Private payers uh, could, in principle, make use. Not, I'm not. I like uh, uh, the CR more as a guidance for reimbursement than coverage. I'd rather just stick with the FDA rules for uh, coverage. Do you see this uh, either as uh, slipping into use, as uh, coming into use, as too scary for most uh, payers to want to touch? I think it's very hard for people to get too far from the herd. Good, good answer. <laughs> um, uh, Joe mentioned uh, something, the challenges of, uh, of new technologies. Um, it's actually where uh, comparative effectiveness research is uh, most typically used in other parts of the world uh, is on the decision as to whether or not to cover uh, a new drug, usually, occasionally a uh, device. Uh, and it's because uh, it's uh, in a group that has a global budget uh, and therefore a fixed limit on their resources. And if they cover this, then they aren't going to be able to cover as much as something else. Um, you were raising some hesitancy about 
uh, the uh, ability of uh, CER uh, to look at new technologies versus existing technologies? Uh, do you think it's do you need a certain amount of time on the market before you really know, or are there were there other reasons for you uh, trying to well, raise it? If, if you just think about it, when the drug gets approved, it's gotten approved on studies of a typically a drug versus placebo that in, in, in most instances right. not in cancer right. but in most so we just want to know as you said that the drug works and it gets in the market we don't know how it compares to another drug now from the patient's point of view they want to know about a range of outcomes and so if you were to mount a comparative effectiveness study the day after a drug got approved you'd have your result in about five years what shall we do for the intervening five years now there may be some ways to take some evidence that's sitting around you certainly know how old drugs do you tend to know that and maybe there are some indirect comparisons and I think uh, what we've tended to do um, in in this country a bit more lately and what's done in other countries is to do models with a lot of assumptions. Um, those assumptions, that's a word for lacks of, lack of evidence, so we will substitute something that's a, a good guess. And um, uh, you know that, that may be the best we can do, but in terms of mounting the new CER studies, we have to face the fact that it takes a while. One thing that could be different is we could get those studies planned at least or even underway before uh, uh, earlier in the cycle so that we're not, you know, the, we, we don't take off the day something gets approved. We've, we've really been looking at this and when I say we, I mean payers, mm -hmm. manufacturers, um, uh, uh, patients looking together uh, and planning how this new treatment, which looks like it's coming into play in the near future, how it fits into the overall approach to patients. Um, so we could be more planful than we are. And um, that's kind of the best I've been able to come up with. You know, we've, PCORI's taken some hits because we don't come in quicker mm -hmm. on new drugs. And, um, uh, and the answer is, uh, that uh, we'll be glad to do the studies, uh, um, but it will take a while. The second wrinkle is in this, while we're waiting and uh, let's say insurers, Medicare or private insurers are unwilling to pay for the drug, our legislation left hanging the question of who would pay for the drugs in a comparative effect in the study. And it's not, the manufacturer is not always motivated to compare their new product with another. And, and, and payers have not seen it to this point in their interest to cover the sort of coverage with evidence development mm -hmm. kind of approach that Medicare has as, at its disposal but does not use all that often. Uh, my impression, although this may not be correct, is there was some debate about whether Medicare actually had the coverage with evidence development legislative authority. Uh, I don't know whether you know whether that was ever clarified. I thought it was a terrific way uh, to uh, not say no or yes, yes, but to gather evidence of what Medicare has traditionally done mm -hmm. is allow mm -hmm. the local carriers uh, to cover or not cover, uh, but that didn't generate any evidence. Uh, so you had differential use, but no evidence if you get the uh, coverage development. We'll try and get that uh, resolved uh, after the fact. Yeah, you had raised that question some time ago, yeah. and I think it's a very, very, uh, Important one, and some very important studies and efforts were launched, for example, uh, expanding the uh, number of people who would benefit from an automatic defibrillator and working very closely with the College of Cardiology and others to make sure uh, that, in fact, as we were expanding the number of people who were likely to get that treatment, we would just learn how they did. It didn't say no. It just simply said, we won't pay unless we get some information back. Making that practical outside of the hospital I think mm -hmm. is a little bit tricky, um, but I think doable. And it'd be interesting to know if, if it was solidified. We'll try and make that. Uh, Murray. Just very briefly to pick up on, on uh, Joe's point about sort of the, the lags here. You know, our, our approvals are based on efficacy, not effectiveness, right. and they're on efficacy for very well-defined homogeneous populations. So when we get into comparative effectiveness, we're changing a lot of things. We're going out into the real world. We're going out with more diverse populations. Um, there's there's a lot to be learned there even before you get to the comparative piece of it. Right. So, so it's a and usually not one change at a time. Yes. We are out of time for our uh, panel, but have time now to. Uh,
uh, ask uh, to see whether the audience has questions and answers. Mm -hmm. or, uh, questions from you, and we'll see if we can provide you with the answers. I'm invited back. Ah, OK. Yes. Hi, I'm Ron Getzel, uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and also uh, Truven Health Analytics, IBM Watson now. Uh, two questions. One has to do with the focus of comparative effectiveness research at Macquarie funding, which sounds like it's mostly 90 plus percent clinical, things that inform the US Preventive Services Task Force. Is there any thinking, any, any uh, potential research that might inform population health, things that would be used by the uh, community guide, the Guide to Community Preventive Services, things like different ways to prevent obesity in a population, or different types of incentive designs in uh, health benefits. Uh, so that's the first question. The other is the different methods that are used in comparative effectiveness. The emphasis is largely uh, RCTs, or randomized clinical trials. Mm -hmm. How much importance is being given to quasi-experimental studies using archival or administrative data? Two big questions, but try to answer them crisply, please. Will do. Um, the first one, we take the word clinical in our name, in, in our mandate to do comparative clinical effectiveness research fairly seriously. But on the other hand, we are heavily invested in obesity prevention and obesity management in childhood and adulthood. Uh, it has a clinical flavor, though. What is the role of primary care? We, we probably wouldn't fund a study about um, programs or uh, about food <coughs> deserts, for example. Just, just. Uh, and the second question uh, was, uh, Different, uh, yes, different yes. Uh, uh. About 70% of what we've funded to date in comparative effectiveness has been randomized trials. And that's because sometimes the differences are small and the, and the chances of confusing, confounded uh, results in observational studies are large. But I will say that I'm a little surprised uh, that we don't have more natural experiments or quasi-experimental. That is, two state Medicaid programs approach the same problem with different strategies. Which one works better? Well, let me just say this. We would entertain and love those, more of those kinds of studies. We don't have a lot of them now. I think it's a great question, and I think there's a lot of potential there. OK, researchers, you heard it her here first. <laughs> Who has theirs? Thank you. Uh, thank you. David Schulke with Health Quality Strategies. Um, it was, uh, Jen gave a great example of a terrific way of getting a patient centered, you know, pretty thoroughgoing comparison of treatment options. Um, but it, my sense uh, from my son's chronic disease and from just being alive in the world and looking at some evidence is that clinicians are not really across the board very effective uh, at shared decision making. Um, Dr. Selby mentioned the research on this. Um, I'm wondering if the systems, uh, if the closed systems, the Kaiser system, the VA systems, have ways of assessing, routinely assessing, and providing feedback to their clinicians so that they are more effective at shared decision making, where they take into account what the patient's life, lifestyle preferences are at the end of life or at any other time. Have you got any kind of mechanisms for that uh, to routinely improve shared decision making? Uh, Murray first for Kaiser and then. Sure, a couple things. Um, one is we have shared decision making tools available, you know, on our on our website for our members to use. Um, but the other piece of it, I guess, it just flows out naturally in terms of um, looking at, at quality improvement and outcome improvement is when you see high performers, high performing physicians or high performing teams inside the system and not so high performing, you have a conversation between the two and say, what is it that you're doing that's working for those patients and getting either you know the better clinical outcomes, the better patient satisfaction scores. Would. So it's it's learning within, within the system. And I, I can't speak to the, sort of the curriculum there, so to speak, but we we can see the results. So Carolyn. one example that we have is actually group visits that focus on advanced care planning. Uh, so veterans get to speak with other veterans. And of course, if they come to a decision or not, and that is totally their call, you know, this is done in the context of the system in which they get care. And I, having tried to fund similar work from ARC, um, I'm not sure you could do it any other kind of way. I actually think, and we do group visits for a lot of different things, particularly mental health. I do believe that that's one area where we could mine more. How do you use this information?
information. So rather than Jen going to her peer networks, right, as a sort of separate enterprise from getting one-on-one -on -one care, it might actually be a little bit more uh, integrated. There's a question. The mic is coming around. Thank you. Hi, thanks. I'm Jeannie Bauman with Bloomberg BNA. I was just wondering if you could comment on the proposal to uh, fold ARC into the NIH and how that would, um, if and how that would sort of shape the direction of this uh, field of, of research and you know what that kind of means on a policy level. Um, since I don't, <laughs> I have no constraints. I'm fine answering that. But would some of the uh, panelists like to uh, answer that? I'd be interested answer? in what you have to oh, say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the issue about whether our can be should be a part of uh, NIH has been going on for the last 40 plus years. I've been a health services researcher, uh, starting uh, as a health services researcher at the predecessor agency of uh, ARC, then known as the National Center for Health Services Research for those with long memories. Um, I'm a little worried, uh, but I think the major issue uh, is whether or not they will be a separate center with their own budget. Uh, that is uh, the most um, assurance, I think, uh, that ARC can have that its functions will remain uh, intact, whereas if it is diffused uh, across various centers, it will be very hard to have that happen. Um, I prefer the uh, standalone agency. Uh, we spend precious little on health services research. Uh, we spend a ton of money on health care uh, utilization. Um, it strikes me that uh, this has always been an incredible uh, imbalance. Um, I hope that NIH will uh, treat it kindly as a separate center if that's what happens, but I am worried. Any? Here's the question. Microphone, please. <coughs> and then one behind. Well, there's two. We'll get them. Hi, <coughs> Phyllis Greenberger from <coughs> Healthy Women. Um, in terms of the comparative effectiveness, uh, uh, it, it, looking at different populations, looking at women versus men, looking at Hispanics and African Americans, obviously that makes things more complicated. And I'm wondering, because the dosage can be different, the effectiveness can be different, how are you going to handle that? Um, and also, when the first speak was talking about the Aspen trial, we know for a long time it was based on men. And then when the trial was done on women, it was a different result. So there's still a lot of gaps in terms of what we know in terms of uh, sex differences, and certainly more in terms of minorities. Joe? Yeah. Well, um, you really nailed it. That's why I'm bullish on CER, because there are a lot of these <laughs> questions that we have just um, um, flown over rather than addressed, and we've practiced uh, with very limited evidence. Um, you point out the challenges of trying to understand uh, different dosages, trying to understand how it works in different subgroups of patients. The uh, one obvious thing is it's going to take larger studies. That's another reason that we invested in PCORnet, which now has over 100 million people in it, including actually a good part of the VA is, is a part of PCORnet, which is a system that starts with electronic health record data but links to claims, tries to, but in regular community settings, not Kaiser only, not the VA only, but systems that we, you know, we wish were more integrated than they were, so that you can do really large studies now and so that you can do them at an affordable price. You, that makes the study simpler. You, you don't add a lot of bells and whistles. You don't add a bunch of serum markers and, and physiologic tests. You ask the question th that you need the answer to, but it enables you to look at subgroups. It enables you to look at different dosages. And um, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions like that if we're going to get the really person, more personalized way of doing healthcare. So Phyllis, let me just say thank you and amen. This is a problem we are challenged. We are seriously embracing at VA. So maybe we can talk more offline about that because mm -hmm. we have some really terrific uh, researchers focused on women's health and where are the interventions similar, where should they be different? And it's not just clinical at all or yeah. purely uh, medicinal. And, and um, I'll just say again, you know, what's yeah. in a name? If we hadn't been named a Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, I don't know that we would have hit upon this 
nearly as hard, uh, nearly as squarely as, as we have. Now it's obvious that we were, have been underutilizing data from trials for a very long time. We have not been getting as much out of them. Notions about predictive uh, analytics, predictive modeling of who will do better with what, um, uh, it's much more in the forefront now. And I think it's partly because that. This is the first level of distinction, the uh, socioeconomic distinctions or racial distinctions. Um, but do you see in the not so distant future being able to get much uh, closer to either uh, genomic or genotype or some metabolic type uh, that uh, looks at characteristics of individuals that may respond differently clinically rather than using as gross proxies uh, racial or ethnic uh, classifications. Not that that won't also remain of interest to people because it will. Yes. Well, that's what we're building right. now. We hope the Corey catches up. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Um, no, I, I think that's, that's, that's true. There was a paper about that just a couple of weeks ago about is precision medicine the end of uh, mm -hmm. racial constructs. And we've always said race is really a sort of a social cultural construct. And I think uh, the availability of genetic information uh, is going to uh, uh, bring that to pass, make yes. that come to pass sooner. But I think that we also at the same time need to understand that precision medicine isn't just about genes. Right. It's about yeah. what language you speak and how far, it is, how far you are from a clinic and uh, whether you can afford transportation and co-payments. Those, those kinds of things aren't in the genes. Yeah. Good yes. morning and thank you for your time. My name is Laura Bennett with Ventec. Um, in terms of touching earlier on a comment that was lightly made about technology, how is that how is its role being played right now in comparative effectiveness research and what trends are emerging and maybe um, touching on telehealth a little bit? Well, you touched on a very interesting yeah. topic. Um, um, PCORI has been, and I know that ARC has been uh, uh, interested uh, before PCORI came along in uh, telehealth. Everybody's interested in telehealth. Uh, it does seem to be a way to deliver care. We're reading about the, the uh, challenges of rural hospitals and rural populations. We're very interested in, at PCORI. I mean, it's, a, it's one of our priority populations, and, and we have a fairly robust uh, portfolio in telehealth, although I think it could be a lot bigger. Um, things are being done in telehealth now uh, that weren't imagined five years ago. I think people are giving TPA, a thrombolytic, for stroke in tele using telehealth methods. They're doing it with a van uh, <laughs> that goes to the farm where a person just had a stroke and, and uh, with a neurologist back at the University Medical Center who's deciding whether to start this person on TPA as they bring them into the hospital. So uh, it's, it's quite amazing. I think technologies in general, we are looking for technologies and, and comparative questions about them that matter to patients and certainly that's telehealth is one that generates a lot of potential solutions for patients. Carolyn? Yeah, I mean, we use telehealth a lot because we are this huge integrated delivery system, in particular for mental health. So um, as I'm speaking, psychiatrists in Manhattan are providing uh, counseling and services to uh, veterans living in very small towns in Oregon. Now, I mean, we, a third of the veterans we serve are actually in pretty remote areas. So it's a huge boon to us. And mental health is not the area at all. And I know some large systems, maybe even Kaiser, have been looking at at the Telestroke uh, initiative. And I do believe there was a company that was founded by someone from GW. So, I mean, this is becoming real. So it, it really gets rid of that aspect of zip code medicine. And the issue isn't the technology, right? It's the delivery of that uh, very specific alternative in a narrow time window. That's what's really exciting about that. So I think we'll see more of that. Murray, does Kaiser use a lot of telehealth? We, we, we use a lot of uh, virtual care. Virtual tel care. Telehealth, yes. or whether or even if it's secure messaging, um, yeah. I think to, to to Carolyn's point too, it's you know it's sort of the system behind the technology rather than the technology per se that that, that really matters here. I mean, one of the issues uh, as an economist worrying about financing of healthcare is recognizing the very different incentives you have if the VA or Kaiser. Yeah. Uh, is using yes. uh, telehealth as opposed to whether it's just an add-on uh, without an easy ability to capture savings uh, as part of the fee-for-service uh, system. And, and that's not really something that uh, PCORI uh, 
I can answer, you can look at whether it's clinically effective and for what and under what circumstances. Uh, but uh, the other issue is, of course, uh, does it make sense to adopt it? And, and then it's hard to do it outside of the financing world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the question is, is it a new service or is it a change in modality of an existing service? Yeah. Yeah. And does it add to total cost or does yeah. it exactly. substitute for other? Yeah. So I just, just want to be real clear that PCORI, in studying this, does study things like resource utilization. Mm -hmm. did, it, did it affect future visits and hospitalization? So, oh, the, that's what, the, so you can so we try to that. sweep in we the, yeah. the issues. OK. Any uh, further There's questions? Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Bobby Clark. I'm curious, obviously for FDA approval, you have to do US studies. Uh, and I'm curious, in terms of comparative effectiveness research, how do you collaborate in internationally with similar institutions? And how is that information applied here in the US? Do you mean collaborate in conducting a piece of research or collaborate in terms of talking with each other about both? how? Uh, well, as you indicate, there are uh, entities, nothing exactly like PCORI, but there are entities like, uh, somewhat like PCORI uh, that, that either do evidence syntheses or in, in the case of the UK, there's yeah, an institute. Nice. Uh, well, not NICE, NIHR. NIHR, oh. NIHR is really uh, uh, the closest thing on this planet to PCORI, and they do, they fund comparative effectiveness research just like we do, and they turn the information over to NICE. We turn the information over to 20 instances of NICE in the U.S. I mean, 20 different entities do the policy um, cost effectiveness or value, as it's called now, and, and we see ourselves as the provider of evidence to, to those who would uh, do cost effectiveness or value. Um, in terms of international research, uh, we do nearly all of our research on U.S. populations. Uh, it's the most generalizable. Uh, if we're supposed to do real world settings, there's nowhere in the world that has the same kind of real world settings that we do. There's a couple instances where for sample size, particularly rarer diseases, uh, we've gone uh, to collaborations that have both U.S. and, and, uh, and uh, international uh, contributors. So particularly in rare diseases, that's useful. Uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to make a, a short response to uh, one final uh, question, which is, um, what are the biggest questions you th in your mind that comparative effectiveness research needs to take on that is not now getting taken on? Carolyn? So I would say uh, chronic pain which I think is a huge, huge problem for this country and certainly for veterans. And, you know, research-wise, it brings in all kinds of complicated dimensions, the longitudinal impacts of treatment, the interactions with complementary modalities, uh, the interaction between the interventions and individuals and in the sort of context around pain. So that would be very, very high on my list, and mental health. Um, and is, are these like a series of studies as opposed to yes. one mega study? Yeah. And some of them for us are in process. Mm -hmm. But the notion of longitudinal follow-up, I think, is huge. And we have the capacity to do that. And I know that others, PCORI and NIH, are building it. Mm -hmm. Joe, you had a major area that you think really needs to get I, I, I don't think I'm going to let you push me into choosing one because I, I just think comparative effectiveness is simply a way of thinking about the care we deliver. So I think from new technologies to lingering problems like back surgery, certainly chronic pain, mental health, we spend more on behavior, mental and behavioral health than any other single topical area. And we didn't plan it that way. It's just what stakeholders brought to us to these very simple, practical, everyday questions and to question uh, using the data better. I, I think. I, I would hesitate to pull out one area as, as uh, because that would suggest that it wasn't equally useful for those others, and I think yeah. it is. <laughs> okay, Murray? Well, hard to argue with uh, mental health and wellness as, as an area that is n not in need of a lot of work. But I would also sort of go outside just the CER paradigm and, and still get back to the dissemination and implementation piece of we could do all the research we want, but if it's not getting uh, to where it needs to be, then it's, then it's, then it's not. And a one or two you wish we had done or we're doing X, uh, or is it just you know, all of the strategies that need to be adopted? Um, I think it's all of the strategies. 
Uh, as our uh, patient representative, Jen, uh, an area that you wish there was more uh, sure. research uh, doing, uh, going on? Sure. I, I wake up grateful every day that my care occurred where it did. I received care in a private research institution in Manhattan. And I'm alive because of that. And I wish that that kind of care occurred in rural hospitals in the United States across socioeconomic and cultural experiences for patients. Thank you. Our time is up. Let me turn it back to Anand. Great, great. Well, Gail, thank you. I want to first just uh, offer a couple of concluding remarks. First, thanks to all of our speakers today, Jody as well, for the terrific opening. Um, uh, speech. Thank you to Jen in particular for sharing your personal story, which I think is very important, and Gail for your leadership moderating the panel. Uh, I want to thank all of you in the audience today for your questions and participation. Really just terrific questions. I want to thank the BPC team as well, uh, in particular Hannah Martin for leading efforts to organize today's event. Uh, as I mentioned earlier at the outset, uh, this is the first of two educational forums on this topic that BBC has organized. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back this summer when we take uh, an even more forward-leaning perspective on where comparative effectiveness research needs to go uh, and how we get there together. So thanks, everybody, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.